Hello and welcome to the Keystone Kickoff Show. I am Jim Galanti. He is T. Frank Carr. First of all, T. Frank, Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year. I sound, at least I did yesterday. I don't know how I'm sounding right now, but yesterday I sounded like my my whole vocal cords, my sinuses, everything had been dragged through a field. So hopefully I'm sounding a little bit better today, but the new year, the bowl game, Christmas, I put my body through the ringer. So I'm glad <laughs> we're still here, honestly. All those doggone holidays and what they yeah. do to poor T. Frank. Well, we all went through it. I've got something going on, too, so I don't think my voice is at 100%. We're killing it. (laughs) Some would say that's the case even when healthy, that my voice isn't 100%. So we'll all have to deal with it, uh, T. Frank. It could always be worse. But speaking of worse, let's talk about Penn State's performance in the Peach Bowl. Yeah. First of all, not a performance that could make any Penn State fan happy, T. Frank. Just your first overview reaction to it. Um, it's hard to know where to start because from a tactic standpoint, you can talk about the way the defense performed. From an offensive standpoint, I can start with how I was pretty disappointed in the way the offense performed um, throughout the first half, especially. And that's when they were competitive in the game. The, the three and outs in, in the third quarter is a whole nother story. And then you can have the conversation about the opt-outs, the reaction to it, and how Penn State handled it heading into the game. Um, I've been thinking a lot about all of those things, and I think they all factor into the conversation and the lead-up to the Peach Bowl. Maybe some of the analysis I had uh, about this game, and then uh, you know the result and, and and how it was wildly different. Uh, than 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 what you were led to believe heading into the game. So, um, th- there's no good place to start with this game. So I guess you just dive in and get your el- you know elbows deep in it. So it, I think from beginning to end though, it's pretty dissatisfying for Penn State fans who I think there is a there is a small amount of fair criticism about the team not playing well in big games. But there's there's a truckload of caveats to this particular game that we can get into. And some fans will be like, yeah, that makes sense. And other fans will be like, I don't care. There is no excuse, et cetera. Well, that's what we're here for, to help the fans come to what at whichever conclusion. And T. Frank, let's start with the defense where the opt-outs really made the difference. Yeah. There were both cornerbacks out, Johnny Dixon, Kalen King. Yep. You had Adisa Isaac. Uh, playing limited snaps, Curtis Jacobs playing limited snaps, and of course, Chop Robinson out. That's five starting players on the defense. Not just five starting players, five really good starting players. Three of your most important players. The the top three most important players to this defense didn't play. So yeah, I mean, that is where you have to start with this game. And it had a significant impact on how... Penn State called the game and the results of the game like Penn State had to adjust in this the way they were playing football because they didn't have Kalen King and Chop Robinson specifically but Johnny Dixon is another big one as well so yeah there's no way around the fact that they didn't have those three players and then you put it you added in the fact that their most talented player Abdul Carter is injured in the second quarter and a lot of the things they were trying to do to make up for the loss of those players, that's all gone because he has a unique skill set that they can use in a couple of different ways and try to cheat the numbers game to help out the passing defense. And and that's gone then um, by the time the third quarter rolls around. Well, let's talk about how they called the game differently with the players out. What were the changes that they attempted to make? So at first, nothing. They tried to play the game as they would have throughout the season. And and you, I think it was you or somebody asked me, maybe it was an Ask T. Frank, about, you know, what's, what's the loss of Manny Diaz mean to this game? And, and truthfully, I didn't know. And I hope that I, I came across that way because there are subtle things about what the play caller is. And I think part of that is also Manny Diaz over the last month not being at Penn State not game planning, not putting things into the defense specifically for Ole Miss because there's a lot of game-to-game, you know, tweaks and and things you can do 
in order to change your scheme so it's not the same of what they've seen on 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 film all year and to have something tailored specifically to the offense you're facing. But what happened in the game was Trey Harris shredded the Penn State defense, specifically Trey Harris. And we'll get to Cade Priestcorn in a second. But Penn State couldn't play press man coverage against him. Cam Miller did a good job fighting and battling, but he was not to the point where he can go toe-to-toe with that guy and keep him under wraps. So, in, an, in, in a thing that they haven't done all year, the Penn State defense backed off. They played zone coverages. They played soft cover threes. They played zone blitzes. Manny Diaz has a resiliency to him to absorb some of those losses and, and keep trucking on, it seems. Even when you look back to some of the times he wasn't successful with his scheme you know, at other places, he was able to find a way to keep playing aggressive and attack mentality, even if there are things that would put a normal defensive coordinator on their heels. So Anthony Poindexter starts calling soft coverages. Penn State loses their advantage in the box. So early on, Penn State is playing their aggressive defense. They're attacking the line of scrimmage. They're playing with uh, K.J. Winston and and Jalen Reed near the box. Suddenly on the second drive, they start, you know, they, they, they get a lot of these quick passes. They get a lot of tempo. And now they're calling base calls and they're calling a lot of soft coverages. And at that point, I don't want to say the game was over, but they were at extreme disadvantage because then they started to give up some run plays towards the end of the second quarter and into the third. And suddenly you're giving up everything because you don't have a way to stop. You're trying to adjust for both. And then your ability to play with a light box, play with just six players in the box is completely gone because Abdul Carter is injured. So they were in a no win situation without Manny Diaz and the ability to play through and play the style of defense you played all year uh, under attrition. Uh, T. Frank, I think something I didn't think about prior to the game is with the missing players, the defensive coordinator out meant even more. The defensive coordinator job was at its toughest in this game because of all the missing pieces. Yep. So that made missing Danny Diaz even more critical, right? And there were communication issues that they haven't had since the Indiana game. And there's some theories as to why that particularly that Indiana game and some of the news and and headlines that came out before then um, maybe uh, changed some things within the defensive structure for that week. You had a month to prepare to get ready for this team. And I counted at least two busted coverages that led to explosive plays. So you've got you've got man coverage when they do play man coverage they had to take account for a couple of things the first thing was and this is really i think one of the plays that that broke the penn state defense especially in pass coverage was that pitch play to quinshaw junkins so i'll take a quick second to break that particular play down so that you understand its impact on the secondary penn state wants to stop the run they want to aggressively fill downhill and put you in third and longs and In that case, Penn State actually got what they wanted. The average third down for Ole Miss was third and 8.8, so almost third and nine. But Ole Miss was able to get explosive plays on third down. They converted a lot of fourth downs as well. And part of the secret sauce is early on, Penn State was able to take that pitch play, which is actually a run play for the quarterback, that is an option pitch to the the running back. Penn State was able to take that and, and shut it down but they overreacted to that play throughout the game. So um, in, on, in one particular situation, you have KJ Winston, who's, I, I think, the spill player in the situation where he's, he's responsible for anything that comes out of the backfield. So they fake the pitch. He comes screaming downhill, and then his man assignment, which is the tight end, leaks on that wheel route up for a touchdown. So the action from the run game and Penn State's aggressiveness downhill Lane Kiffin and Ole Miss used that against Penn State, and there were busted communications where, you know, in the past, Penn State would have had that in a a better functional way to stop that. Somebody else would have been responsible instead of bringing the safety from depth and having him uh, have this two-way responsibility. At least that's the way it played out from what I saw, Um, that it wasn't Daquan Hardy. It was K.J. Winston who was responsible for that. So then you have an injured Abdul Carter, and suddenly that pitch play works as a run play and they're getting they're getting explosive yardage out of that. They get Penn State in a situation where they're overcommitting to the the box. 
You have fewer defenders, as we talked about, because there's guys 15 yards down the field in coverage. I haven't seen that from Penn State all year. Now, that doesn't mean it didn't happen, but uh, that that was new to me watching that. So then those running plays start to work a little bit better. And that's really when you have the worst case scenario, which is you don't know what to adjust to. And you're being put in no win situations by the uh, the offense. Um, and then, of course, your veteran players, Curtis Jacobs, Adisa Isaac, they come in for some celebrity appearances after the first drive of the third quarter, but they're done after that. So you then lose two more talented players, and now you're playing essentially with your second team defense, which I think was a disappointment. You know, there are players that have played all year or that have gotten significant playing time, maybe in mop-up duty, but that did not play as we expected. You know, I think Amin Vanover and uh, and Zariah Fisher were two of them that did not play well, um, and certainly not to what they did in, in spot duty early in the year. So just a number of issues for the Penn State defense. But it starts with they couldn't do the things they did all year, which made them adjust into no man's land. So, T. Frank, is it just unfair as Penn State fans to look at this game and make any judgment based on – you have yeah. the number one defense probably in the country, and you could argue that the six best players, more than half of your starters on defense, and the best ones were either out of the game completely or played very limited. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. <laughs> I mean, it, it does set you up for what is this defense going to be in 2024? Now they'll have a month to, they'll have more than a month to prepare their plan for next year. And uh, it's not all terrible. I think from a physical standpoint and from a reaction standpoint, Zion Tracy got burned a couple times, but he looked good. Like I, I finally got to see Zion Tracy play football in a meaningful way. He's explosive. He is fast. He is fluid. He is going to be a good football player, but in the situation, he was not necessarily Johnny Dixon. Um, so there are some positives. Tony Rojas made some mental mistakes, but again, looked like Tony Rojas filled the run really well. There are positives that come out of this from guys that played, but, um, yeah, if you're talking about, uh, a, a complete offense with no opt outs, that is very good and has multiple ways to hurt you. And you're losing all of your starters that are NFL talent worthy. Yeah. It's a miracle. You have to be, you have to be, you know, too deep uh, and in all Americans to be able to you know, keep up with that. Absorb that. All right, that is it for quarter number one. We're going to talk about some of the individual players when we get back in quarter two. Stick with us. Hey, it's T. Frank. Uh, the holidays are over. Happy New Year, I guess you can still say here uh, in the first week of the new year. But really, Penn State football is over. We're into the winter, and it's the long, slow grind until spring. Uh, something that can help you out with that is RogueShop.com uh, to get you through the winter blues or maybe uh, to help you with any of the problems you might have in your life that you're not just quite getting enough help with. You know, chronic p conditions like stress, pain, fatigue, anything like that. Um, RogueShop.com, they've got something for just about everybody and they have a different way for people to take it depending on what they're comfortable with. Uh, what I've given you, told you about before here, the Delta gummies or what I use um, when I need to go to sleep and stay asleep and get a restful night after a long, stressful day or week. So go to RogueShop.com, use promo code BWI to get 10% off. And if you have any questions, the chat is super helpful because Char is a real person and she's there to answer your questions and help you find what you need if you want to go to rogueshop.com and get relief for the winter blues. Hello and welcome back to the Keystone Kickoff Show. It's quarter number two. He's T. Frank. I'm Jim. Both of us, T. Frank, a little bit under the weather, but we're gamers. Yeah. Playing hurt. You We're going to ignore her. the fact that I totally petered out at the end of the first segment and I was basically stumbling over to the goal <laughs> line. But yes, you know, we're, we're fighting through it. This is going to still be a win for everybody. You play hurt. You don't play injured. We're playing hurt, T. Frank. Yeah. And unlike many on the Penn State defense, we're not sitting out. We're playing the whole game here today, all four quarters. Uh, T. Frank. In talking about this game, though, I want to—I do want to point out one thing that I think gets lost in all of this. Mm -hmm. Ole Miss played really well. Yes, their quarterback they, did yeah. a great job. 
that wide receiver, in fact, early in the game when uh, Cam Miller was getting beat, and I'm using air quotes for it, I I think it was just a receiver playing really, really well and a quarterback playing really well. Yeah, one of the things we, we talked about coming into this game is Jackson Dart has great ball placement. He's able to put the ball exactly where it needs to be to the correct shoulder, to the correct depth, the, the angle it comes down into the basket away from the defender. There were some indefensible passes where – um, maybe a little bit of a push off, maybe a lot of bit of a push off right before, <laughs> but then Trey Harris comes down with the ball directly where it needs to be. And he does a great hands catch looks great doing it. And that's a, I think it was like a 20 yard completion down into the red zone. I can't remember if it was Cam Miller or Zion Tracy that was in coverage there, but they didn't have an, they didn't have the opportunity to defend the football. It was put exactly where it needed to be. And even though they were in decent coverage, those factors lead to them not being a part of the play. Let me just underscore this whole point with with a couple of stats that I think are alarming and indicative of exactly how the secondary played against Ole Miss. So there's two advanced stats that I like to look at when you're talking about a quarterback. And we've seen this all year from, from quarterbacks against Penn State. Their clock is sped up. So... 2.5 seconds is about the amount of time that the average quarterback holds onto the football before they throw it. That's the average length of a play. Um, the Jackson Dart was getting the ball out in 2.33 seconds, which is a massively shortened amount of time for the second for the pass rush to get there. So Penn State's pass rush, as much as I said, I mean, Van Over and Zariah Fisher weren't doing uh, you know the same job that Chop Robinson did. That's also not fair to them because they couldn't get to the quarterback. The ball was out before they could get there. And normally that means short passing attack, ball control, Talia Tunga Valoa throwing into cover two for 14 hours a day, right? You know, short passes, not getting it downfield. Jackson Dart's average depth of target was 10 yards down the field. So he's throwing the ball immediately to a target that's open 10 yards down the field. That shows you the, the level of resistance that Penn State was giving Ole Miss in the secondary and their issues with communication and also the scheme with which Lane Giffen was, was drawing things up. They played a style of offense and came into the game ready to throw the football. Uh, the first drive didn't go their way, and it kind of set a false tone for the game that if you didn't catch up with quickly, you didn't realize the shift that had happened where they were going to be a, they were going to try and run the football, establish that balance early, and then throw the football, which they'd done all year. But they went right to the drop back passing game after that. And all year long, they had struggled with a drop back passing game and kind of avoided because their their offensive line was not good enough to hold up and give Dart the time to throw. And he would have to scramble and run and then make a play out of structure. He didn't have to do that. He just had to catch the ball and throw in this game. And that, I think, is probably the most disappointing thing if you're the Penn State defense is that's like, what's the pass rush supposed to do? What's your defensive line supposed to do at that point? Well, it gave... You're right. I'm one of those who really jumped on those first two possessions of the game. Ole Miss's first possession, Penn State's first possession. And what we saw was pressure getting to the mm -hmm. Ole Miss quarterback and then Penn State getting the ball and just running chunk play after chunk play. But with that first possession, it looked to me like, all right, they're still going to get after the quarterback effectively yeah. and get to him. And from that point forward, it looked like they just decided we're going to get rid of the ball so fast that Penn State's rush isn't going to be a factor. Yeah, it's and that's really what happened is they, they I won't say they abandoned the run because they didn't, but they came out the next drive and threw the ball three or four times in a row. And one of the things they did early, and you know these are just the little things that happened once or twice. It's not the whole story of the game, but... Um, to get their passing game going, what they did is they 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 had a stack and then they motioned out of it where now you have Trey Harris in the slot against Cam Miller and he can go either direction. And that led to just a, a I don't want to say an easy completion because Trey Harris has to be good enough to make Cam Miller go on its, you know, on his heels. But then they get a, a 10, 12 yard completion and then they start to roll where they use their tempo to get Penn State in a situation where they can't get into the right defense. They can't call. Uh, exactly what they want or or use formation and scheme to put uh Ole Miss in a place that is advantageous for the defense Ole Miss dictated the terms with their tempo and they were able to execute effectively and, and you know at that point Penn State was off to the races in, in a bad way 
Uh, T. Frank, before we start with Penn State's offense, let's just wrap up the Penn State defense. Tell me about the young guys who played. You alluded to it a little bit. The cornerbacks probably put into a little bit of an unfair situation. We still really haven't gotten a full story on Kalen King. Did they expect him to play? He was practicing with the team, and you yeah. know, that, that's part of that prep discussion. But forgetting that for a second, how did those young cornerbacks play? I know the end result wasn't great. What did you see from them? Uh, they were – Cam Miller, I thought, played well. Uh, <laughs> in, in the sense that he didn't play well, I thought he played well. So he was targeted 12 times by one of the best quarterbacks and one of the most cohesive passing attacks they've seen all year. The regular corners, and, and by that I mean the starters, would have struggled with that def- with that offense um, a-, a little bit as well. Maybe they don't, they don't have a full-on meltdown uh, like the Penn State defense did, but at a certain point, they, they still would have given up yardage. You know, they were doing things to isolate Cam Miller against Trey Harris and get, you know, RPOs, um, boundary X receiver alone with 20 yards of grass and then throw him the football. And that's a that's a hard assignment. He battled through. He had a pass breakup uh, later in the game. He started. He never really lost confidence. He kept playing. He kept chopping wood as to use a cliche. And, um, you know, didn't finish with numbers that looked good. But if you the eye test, he battled through. And I thought he did a pretty decent job as far as his first game starting in, in a really rough situation. Um, Zion Tracy, I mentioned, looked good in terms of physical abilities and the ability to break on the ball. I think he's going to have an opportunity to be good in um, in Tom Allen's defense if they go to kind of a zone approach because it's all about your explosiveness downhill and getting to the football, um, you know, in anticipatory situations. But the guy I want to go to next, and I think that this is really frustrating, is that we were about to get, it seemed like, a Micah Parsons-level cotton bowl from Abdul Carter. He was a force in the passing game, where on that first drive, he took Quinshaw Junkins, who's 216 pounds or something like that, big big back that is good in pass protection, and put him on his butt to get to the quarterback on a blitz. He was everywhere in the passing game. He was um, disruptive in the run game. He was doing that sideline to sideline thing that makes everyone's eyes go the size of quarters. It was really impressive. And then Ole Miss throws a cut block and falls on his ankle, and then he's done for the day. Like, he still plays until midway through the third quarter, but the Abdul Carter you were watching is gone because he can't, he has no power through contact. He's virtually, the things that make him special are all gone, and he has to play like a player that uh, has no power, right? That can't fight through, uh, through offensive linemen the same way. So that's a bit frustrating because he was entertaining to watch. He was the one chess piece that Penn State had left that they could use in a bunch of different ways. Um, and this brings me back to just another one of those T. Frank pet peeve things. Cut blocks are dishonorable, in my opinion. Like, I find them to be distasteful. I understand that coaches will use them and that they are not illegal. But when you admit, I'm not athletic enough to block this guy. I can't get to the point of attack. So I'm going to dive at his knees as a, as a scheme. Like, that, that bugs me. That's always bugged me. I think that stinks. It's not just the injury here. But Penn, again, Penn State hasn't seen a whole lot of cut blocks this year. And Ole Miss was throwing them around at all of Penn State's athletes because they weren't fast enough to get there. So you just throw your helmet at their knees and hope you hit them in the thigh and they fall over. And... <laughs> It, it yes, a- and anything that is a injury causing technique, y- you don't want to see that. And it, just that technique alone, when you talk about it in terms of, it's typically a lesser player against a better player, and that that ends up with a star player injured and out. And after having so many other players out for Penn State. It, it just handicaps them so much. So uh, just a rough game overall. Let me uh, let me put a bow on this by asking about Anthony Poindexter mm-hmm. and his performance in calling the defense. Very, very much handicapped, T. Frank. Mm-hmm. What, what can you take away, though, from uh, the coaching performance on the defensive side? 
I don't know what I would have done in his situation. And this is kind of what I was trying. This this is what I was trying to say uh, about Anthony Poindexter and careful what you wish for, because if you expect him to be Manny Diaz, you know, in 2024, they're still not going to have those players. Adisa Isaac, Chop Robinson, Kalen King and Johnny Dixon are all gone. Daquan Hardy is gone. He played in the game. He actually put some stuff on the line and played in the game. Um, so if you're expecting a Manny Diaz result without Manny Diaz, careful what you wish for. This is just a taste of that because certain situations are going to elicit a different result or a different uh, reaction. I don't know how Manny Diaz would have coached that game, honestly. But from what I've seen of him, the answer is more attacking, more pressure, more uh, of you know the things that Penn State fans love. And he always found a way to mitigate the damage on the back end, the risk on the back end. But in this game in particular, the communication was not to the same level on the defense where they had more mental busts and guys giving up big plays. Tony Rojas. So here's an example. And this is quick. I know that we're at the end of the clock. Tony Rojas comes in for an injured Abdul Carter and they have what's called a green dog blitz, where if your guy is in pass protection, you rush the passer except that no one checked to see if Quinchon Jenkins was actually pass protecting and suddenly he leaks out for a touchdown. That's something I pointed out when, when Manny Diaz got here of like, that's a possibility. And yet it never happened when Manny Diaz was here and it happened several times in this game. So, I mean, it, it, you, you lose the secret sauce when you lose the guy who created the defense. And next year though, there's five NFL players that aren't going to be there anymore. I'm not sure Manny Diaz next year would still be Manny Diaz when yeah. you lose five NFL players. All right, that's it for quarter two. Next up, we take your questions. It's Ask T. Frank. Hello and welcome back to the Keystone Kickoff Show. He's T. Frank Carr. I'm Jim Galante. It's quarter three, and it's time to ask T. Frank. We're going to take your questions for T. Frank. And if you want to send a question, T. Frank, here's what you do. You download our app, Keystone Sports. You will see the Ask T. Frank and Ask Andy button. Just hit that button and you're on your way. T. Frank, you ready to roll? No. This week, no. I, I, I'm anticipating these questions aren't going to be all that fun to answer. But we'll do it. <laughs> That's what we're paid to do. So we will answer these questions. All right, let's do it. Let's start with Steve in Huntington Valley, who says, T. Frank, talk to me about the wide receivers. Seems to me the entire unit regressed after the West Virginia game. <clears throat> Fast forward to the bowl game. McLean, Cephas can't even get on the field. Lambert Smith mm -hmm. has one target that he drops. Clifford has to get the Penn State first uh, wide receiver reception well into the second half. Did you see something from a technical standpoint yes. or was it just a lack of effort or interest that caused this unit to take 12 steps backwards after game one? So I'm not going to go into the full season because I feel like we've adjudicated that already. Um, but in this particular game, and let's talk about, let's rewind at least to the Rutgers game and on when it's Jay Wansider and Ty Howell. Um, this, the theme of the theme of their offense has been get the tight ends, of the football. So the receivers don't have any targets. They had three tight ends on the field for several passing plays. What are you expecting? They, they have one receiver on the field. So the point has been to de-emphasize the receivers. The point has been to de-emphasize Keandre Lambert Smith as wide receiver. Number one, and to try to get the ball into the hands of Tyler Warren and Theo Johnson, specifically those two guys. And then from the passing game, also incorporate more of the running backs. So in the first half of the game, when Penn State is trying to operate their drop back passing game, they're targeting Theo Johnson and Khalil Dinkins uh, and excuse me, Tyler Warren and Khalil Dinkins. There's one play I broke down uh, on my film room um, for the for the offense, the, the, the real first passing play of the game. The X receiver is a tight end later in the game. There's an RPO. The the X receiver is a tight end. They're targeting the tight ends. So in this particular game, not getting a receiver a target, it was intentional. Um, they threw some of the, the, they did throw a pass near the end zone to Trey Wallace that was incomplete. James Franklin lost his mind about pass interference. I think he was, it was fair 
not on that play, but Keandre Lambert Smith was literally tackled by the defensive back. That should have been a first down, but it wasn't called. So one or two targets. Now, in terms of scheming guys open, receivers did get open. Um, there were a couple of plays, again, a handful of plays because most of the targets are going to the tight ends. But there was a play where on third down, Drew Aller scrambles for a first down because he has immediate pressure in his face, but they got uh, Caden Saunders open for a third down. They had Liam Clifford open for a first down. It's just not the guys that you were expecting um, because there's a lot that there, there was a lot of checked outness from some of the guys that had played early in the year. Dante Cephas doesn't play in the game. Keandre Lambert Smith, as you mentioned, has one target. Um, some of these things are intentional and some of these things are the product of work. Certain guys I'm going to assume are putting in more work and are getting more love in the offense. And, and that's, that's the bottom line in the bowl game is they had a plan to get the ball to the tight ends. And that was, that was it. All right, let's stick with the wide receiver theme. This is Riley from Arlington, Virginia, who says T Frank, are there two wide receivers on the current roster who could be major contributors next year? So this is the problem is that the answer is yes, but they're both slot receivers. You know, I Trey Wallace is going to be a part of the, the, the passing game. He still has talent. He needs to put it all together, and he needs to stay healthy. That's a major thing. So he has talent. He's going to be a contributor. But the other guys that I think play the most consistent football are less valuable because they're slot receivers. So you've got, again, I mentioned Caden Saunders can contribute. He can, he's a guy that gets open. Um, but he's behind several other football players. And by the way, they don't have a slot receiver on the field because you need three receivers to have a slot receiver. So he needs to be on the field if they're going to be going back to 11 personnel or they need to find a way to get him open and, and, and scheme things open. That's the whole point of any Kotal Nicky and bringing him in. Right. So Liam Clifford, Caden Saunders are the two that I think are consistent. I wouldn't give up on Malik McLean just yet. Obviously a guy with talent, but needs to put it all together. So the, the vibe in the room needs to change the mentality of the room and the, and, and that whole leadership soft skill ethos needs to have a dramatic change. And I think that there is some of that that's going to come this off season. All right, let's go to Jason in Altoona who says, Drew Aller came up very small in the three losses this year. Besides the fact that Michigan and Ohio State have very good defenses, what are you seeing in those performances, T. Frank? Um, some of them he's put a, in a position to fail. So we've talked in depth about how they didn't allow him to throw the football against those teams, and then suddenly they needed him to win the game late. They didn't do that to him in this game. He was a major part of the drop back passing game in the first half. And, and I did just the first half running and passing earlier this week in T Frank's film room, because to me, like the third quarter severed the game. Penn state had nine plays in the third quarter. And by that point, the game is over. So now you're in the fourth quarter and things are dire. He was not good when there wasn't that fourth quarter game pressure. He is hesitant to throw the ball into tight windows despite having, despite seeing that he's supposed to throw it there, looking there to his first read correctly, and then passing up plays in order to scramble, check the ball down, get antsy in the pocket, not want to get sacked. He needs a rebuild of his confidence in himself, it seems. And this is me, just armchair psychology, quarterbacks, things I'm, I'm not uh, uh, qualified to do. But you look at his, his play on tape and the throws that a quarterback, like my job is to pass the ball. I'm not a dual threat. I'm not a guy that's going to use the option game. I need to generate explosive plays with my mind and with my arm. He's not making those plays. And he, in this game, was the reason they were deferring that late into the fourth quarter before the decision had been taken out of his hands a good bit by just running the football and putting him in like, Hey, it's third down. Now go be a hero. They gave him first down options to throw the ball down the field outside of interceptions that he shouldn't have thrown. You know, the deep pass that uh, Ole Miss anticipated. There were plays that he needed to make that he didn't pull the trigger. So he needs to be better. 
You know, that's an area they had a month coming into this game with a better scheme around him with better, uh, op- you know, still you don't have receivers. You're still throwing the ball over the middle to tight ends and you're not threatening to the outside. So these are tight passes. There's no way around that part, but you would expect him with a support structure and, a, and maybe a better environment to work in for a month for this game. I expected more out of Drew in this game. And maybe that's unfair of me because he still doesn't have receivers, but that's what it is. Like he had opportunities to throw the ball into windows and he chose not to. And that's a problem if that's your skill. And, you know, they've got to rebuild that part next year. It's fascinating to me, T. Frank, after a Penn State loss or not a very good performance by the offense, we get both sides. You know, why aren't they throwing the ball more? Let yeah. Drew Aller be Drew Aller. And then we're hearing, why don't they run the ball more? I'm using yeah. that as a prelude to um, our next question. Tommy from York says, how do you explain Nick Singleton with only eight total carries and only four after the first quarter? They had nine plays in the third quarter and they gave up 11 points. So, okay. First off, I just want to one last thing about the uh, passing game. The offensive line blocking was atrocious. They were getting three man pass rushes, eight, drop eight in coverage, and there's pressure up the middle. Inexcusable. That cannot happen. Um, so it's not just Drew Aller. I just want to make sure that I'm fair on that point. But to Tommy from York, if you have nine plays, you don't have enough time to get anyone the football. So then you're down 31 17 in the fourth quarter. Um, yes, you can run the football and you can stay true to who you are, but you've got a major deficit and you don't expect your defense to stop this team. So you only have a certain number of possessions left with 15 minutes. You need points and you need them fast. So they actually start that drive running the football fourth quarter. He gets some carries, um, and they're able to get an explosive play to start the drive. Then they go no huddle. They eventually, I think on this play on this drive, I think they, they, either score they get a field goal opportunity which they miss i forget exactly the sequence here but at that point it bleep hit the wall you need to get points and you don't get points by being methodical and running the football um so that's 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 the answer you had nine plays in the third quarter you went three and out three straight times i don't know the number of yards you had but it was not a whole lot so it doesn't matter who like tyler warren feed him the ball more um, the receivers didn't get any passes. Uh, Katron Allen didn't have enough runs in the game. Nick Singleton didn't, they didn't have enough plays. They needed more plays when the ball game was within reach, the competitive portion of the game. They just didn't get it because they didn't have, they didn't, they, they failed to convert third down. When you do three and outs, I think in the third quarter, there was a total of 10 or nine offensive plays, three, three and outs. And Ole Miss had 20-some plays, so you're not going to win games that way, and you're not going to get many opportunities. Let me give you this. 134 yards in the third quarter only for Ole Miss, 14 yards for Penn State. They ran the ball four times. They threw the ball 11 times. So, okay, in the third quarter, you should have run the ball six times and had nine passes. You're still going three and out. You know, I'm just uh, rearranging the deck chairs here. Like, they needed to, they needed to get first downs, and they didn't. Well, Ed, there's not enough time for the next question. I don't want to cheat it, and I was going to try to scroll through the uh, game log. But if you look, I'm, I suspect the couple running plays did not give you many yards. If you're going three and out, you're not getting very many yards. And any crazy <laughs> I'm, I'm critique sorry. of the offense. Go ahead. I was I was wrong. It was 11 rushing yards. They ran the ball four times and passed the ball three times. So they did. They did focus on running the football in the third quarter. They had one more rush than they did passing plays. They were two of five on passing plays. Uh, man, I'm doing a terrible job reading this. The two of five on passing plays. They had uh, four rushing attempts. Doing this live is dangerous. So, yeah. <laughs> Five to four, nine total plays. They had 14 yards, three yards passing, 11 yards rushing. So they focused on running the football in the third quarter to as much of a degree as they could when they're in third down and losing. And, and the pressure is mounting for them to get points because, uh, you know, o- Ole Miss went for it on fourth down three times in the game. That extended drives and got them points. And they played aggressive and they were re- rewarded for it. 
All right, that is it for quarter number three. And ask T. Frank, we still got more to go. Stick with us for quarter four. Hello and welcome back to the Keystone Kickoff Show. It is quarter number four. He's T. Frank. I'm Jim. We're talking Penn State Ole Miss in the Peach Bowl. T. Frank, uh, based on some of the questions in Ask T. Frank segment, we were looking at the statistics from the third quarter. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, In the break, I brought it up. That was about as ugly a quarter statistically um, and by the eyeball test. Just real quick, Ole Miss scores 11 points, Penn State nothing. First downs, Ole Miss 10, Penn State 0. Total offensive plays and yards, Ole Miss 25 plays for 139 yards, Penn State 9 plays for a total of 14 yards. It doesn't get any uglier than that, T. Frank. Yeah, and to Tommy's question, how does Nick Singleton only end with eight carries? Um, If you look at, you know, and I apologize, this is just receptions here. He had five targets, four receptions. So he had the ball in his hands 12 times. Catron Allen had 10 carries. So Nick Singleton ends the game with 12 total touches to lead the team. Like, Nobody else saw the ball more than Nick Singleton. It's just that nobody saw the ball because it was 49% completion percentage. Tyler Warren has nine targets in the game, 127 yards to lead the team. Um, and that should tell you that's the story of the game is that Nick Singleton had over 100 total yards. You have to account for all of those targets as well. Catron Allen has 10 carries for 51 yards, but they don't have the opportunity to get the ball in the third quarter. And by that point, the game's not over. But the it's significantly lopsided to the point where you're not going to be able to run the football anymore. And and that's that's on the defense and their inability to stop anybody after halftime and the uh, some of the problems they had with, you know, the first drive of the third quarter, Ole Miss has to settle for a field goal. Adisa Isaac and Curtis Jacobs are playing. They don't play again. There's a celebrity appearance, I think, by both of them in the next drive. And then that's it. So Penn State starters and the guys that are impact players are not in the game after that point. And Ole Miss goes on a run where they score, uh, you know, eight points. And, and then, you know, they score more to get to 38 after the, the starters are out of the game as well. So it was just the sequencing of everything was terrible for Penn State and, and some of the other things going on that happened, you know, with such an implosion by the offense. Because they played, by the way, because... They had a lot of young players in the game making bad mental mistakes that led to three and outs. It's not just Drew Aller. That's a part of the game where Khalil Dinkins drops a football. Drew Shelton gives up an easy pressure on a run play. Drew Aller makes some bad decisions. And then you've got other young players that are in there not executing and getting open. So it, it's it's a cacophony of problems that led to Penn State. When you look at it in hindsight, knowing that you're not having all of your top players play, 38-25 is a pretty reasonable expectation for this game for a team that had one opt-out. And if you look at this game, let's look at the offensive side of the ball a little bit. And a mm-hmm. lot is being th- thrown at the wide receivers. And you could look at this a hundred different ways. Is it just, hey, they, the game plan was to get the ball to the running back, get the ball to the tight end, so the wide receivers weren't part of the game plan. I was going to ask also, you saw then in the fourth quarter, I know it's garbage time. I know mm-hmm. that. But you're able to get completions to Liam Clifford, to Trey Wallace in that fourth quarter. Were there ways that they could have gotten the ball to wide receivers early? You know, we were hearing about James Franklin talking about we got to get easy passes for Drew Aller. It didn't seem like we saw that. It's This is the problem. When you're up 38-17, your style of defense and your goals as a defense change where it's no longer about stopping points. It's about bleeding clock. So you're getting different coverages and you're getting different, um, you're getting different intensity and focus from the defense. So one of the biggest things is they got the ball out. Drew Aller, you know, kind of, hitched up his wagon and and got going and threw the ball out on time and got the ball out into space, but there was more space. And yeah, they went to more three receiver sets and Trey Wallace got the ball a little bit more, but it is, it's, it's impossible for me to sit here and untangle 
what the subtle differences are from Ole Miss, knowing essentially they've won the game and they're just trying to prevent disaster. And Penn State getting out of there, we need to play three tight ends, ball control offense, because we controlled nothing. And now we have lost control, so we need to change our game plan. I, I Generally, I say, yeah, you need to play with a little more urgency in the first quarter so that it doesn't take until the fourth quarter to score points. But again, they had nine plays in the third quarter where there's a lot of things being determined there. And you could still play your ball control offense and play three tight ends, even though Theo Johnson stopped playing at halftime. So no, you had to play more two receiver sets. You had to play more 22 personnel. You can't play three tight ends uh, at that point. So you do have to adjust because of that. But at the same time, like you are still playing that safe football. And then when they stop playing safe football, they start moving the football. So what are the factors in there and how much, what's the percentage of, uh, you know, responsibility one or the other? I can't determine that. I just know that those are the factors in the fourth quarter and it's just too little too late. And that's why I look a lot at the first quarter and some of the things that Aller did and some of the things the offense did is the real problem because you set yourself up where you could have had more points early in the game and you didn't get there. Let's talk a little bit about the offensive line, uh, T. Frank. We know uh, Fashionu was out for the game. Caden Wallace, I have him down uh, for a total of 26 plays. Yeah. So he, he didn't play a great deal can, of the game. Can I um, uh, stop you right there with the Caden Wallace situation, which I thought this is, this is kind of frustrating um, from an analysis standpoint, too. Uh, <laughs> you come into the game. And Kalen King's practicing. And then James Franklin's asked about Kalen King, and he goes on glowingly about how, you know, guys play in the game and it makes sense for them. And I don't know if at the 11th hour, Kalen King opted out and James Franklin's put in a bad situation. That's a reality. But the way they talked about it and the subterfuge of who's going to play and how much they're going to play and everyone's here and Olu Fashanu is a part of the experience in Atlanta. And then right before the game, he doesn't play. It is just so frustrating to go into that game and have any idea of what to expect from a reality standpoint. Because I can sit here and tell you, Jim, it makes no sense for Kalen King to play. It makes no sense for Olu Fashinu to play. But they're acting like it's going to happen, and all of this kind of kabuki theater that we go through with James Franklin and, and these decisions of who's not going to play and who's going to play. And then in the game, it doesn't matter. Because Ole Miss figures it out after a quarter, and then they just play the way you would play when their best players aren't playing. Um, so the, to Caden Wallace, you know, he played in the game and I want to give him credit for it, but everyone's protecting their draft stock. He gives up that pressure on Drew Aller that results in the interception. He doesn't play another play in the game. So he gives up one sack and then he's done. So like, that's how the game went for Penn State. And, and T Frank, I, we don't know as fans what James Franklin knew ahead of time. I got the feeling he didn't know that Kalen King wasn't going to play at all. And, I, you know, maybe it's shame on him for not knowing that. But as fans, you're all right. You talk about it as an analyst. I'll talk about it as a fan. You know, we got, you're right. We got that whole, this is the Penn State culture was created. Guys are going to show up. Guys are going to play. And then they don't. And I really, really am disappointed that fashion. He was suited up, had the pads on, all of that. And that one, they knew he wasn't going to play. Yeah, like I know they that knew he one wasn't for play. sure. What are you putting the pads on for? Really? Right, that's my point. Right. I, that's I, my I, point. Like, who are you fooling at that point that is going to give you a, it may be the first drive, you know, like all of a sudden. They're expecting one thing, they get another, they've got a game plan, and, and you get a touchdown, and maybe that's the difference in the game. And maybe that's what James Franklin's holding on to. I, I don't, I, I, even when I'm frustrated, because I feel like a fool, I, would, I believe people when they say stuff. And, you know, like Kalen King being at practice and suddenly he's not playing, changed my analysis heading into the game, that I thought they would have a better chance of keeping a clamp on that passing attack and, and putting the screws to the run game. Uh, and that was not the case. So it's, it, it's in the end, it doesn't matter. All of this doesn't matter. Um, and, but it, it is frustrating to try and get ready for the game and get hyped for the game if you're a fan or try to have an idea of what's going to happen. And then all of these things that maybe other people know for, sure, for certain, we don't have that information. 
And and T Frank, every player has the right to sit out this game. Yeah. Okay. I may not like it as a fan, but they have the right to do that, and I support that right. What I don't get is a Kalen King. If you're not going to play in this game, don't practice for a month. Go get ready for the combine. To me, that's as much as risk of injury. The other part of this is go train for the combine. Right. Cut a tenth of a second off your 40-yard dash if possible and make yourself another million dollars because you're you're faster or you're stronger or whatever. Don't go to practice for no reason. But anyway, let's look at some of the players on the offensive line who yeah. did play. We saw Drew Shelton. We saw Anthony Donka mm-hmm. as our starting tackle. Or they played most of the game at the two tackle positions. What did you see from them? Uh, it was a, I think, I don't want to say alarming because it's one game, but Drew Shelton's been preparing for this moment for two years now, and it did not look good. From a run perspective, there were some things that happened early that were good, and then from a pass perspective, there were some alarmingly bad things that haven't gotten any better, it feels like, you know, from, from what he was doing his freshman season. So he's got a lot of work to do this offseason. It's his third year. This is the time he's supposed to step into that that role. And we saw a similar thing from Fashinu, where he was great in 2021 before he took over. And this is that's concerning. Anthony Donko looked good. Um, he was moving people off the football run game, especially. He had some dominant reps. There's some things to clean up as a pass protector, but what that right tackle position is wide open and he had a pretty good audition to be the first guy to compete for it for 2024. So that was encouraging, but drew Shelton, that was, that was a little bit alarming and concerning for Penn state's future left tackle. Presumably we've been presuming that for two years now. Last question. How alarmed were you by um, drew Aller's performance? I don't want to say alarmed, but I am concerned. I've been banking on drew progressing and taking that next step from a mental perspective in all of these situations hope is always around the corner right so they'll progress the receivers will get better throughout the season and then it'll be easier for him they'll work out this offense in their plan that didn't happen so then you fire the offensive coordinator so now we're going to put players in position to succeed we're going to focus on the tight ends he's going to throw the football mild progress there but then he had a month to prepare for this game and we saw the same problems we saw throughout the regular season. So to me, that is concerning. But the hope is that Andy Koldenicki can fi- fix this and make the offense simple and clear for the quarterback, which is, you know, it's nine months away, nine months more of hope or concern. Very good. Thanks, T. Frank. That is it. We're out of time. Thank you all for listening. Make sure you join us next time on the Keystone Kickoff Show.